in um, our last session. My name is uh, Stabile Mate. I'm a practicing architect. My company is called uh, Moralo Designs. Um, I also, I'm also chair of the Architects Registration Council and I'm also chair of the Botswana Housing Corporation uh, Board. I'm keenly interested in the development of our profession, the development of how we train our professionals and the growth of um, the growth of the industry in, in general. So I'm going to take us to our first speaker, Mayor Seteba, if um, I can hand over to you. Thank you. Don't forget to unmute thank your Thank you mic. so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sita. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Um, is it visible to everybody? Yes, it is. It is visible. Okay, great. Um, again, thank you, Sita, and to Boweko and Medical Academy for organizing such a relevant conversation um, at this time. Um, just going to start. So my portion for today is to share and discuss on these very popular words that have um, been discussed a lot in the past couple of years and more relevantly this year which is the fourth industrial revolution and the built environment, um, currently our economic crisis or just the global economic crisis, and then the digital and broader technology revolution that we are um, experiencing and rather what to do with it in the um, built environment. I want to first talk about what FOIR is um, globally and what it is in the built environment and um, dispel the notion that FOIR is some far-fetched invention that we need to strive for as a country and that our economy cannot achieve it because we believe government is not doing enough. First, um, we are already in the fourth industrial revolution because it is characterized um, by the use of technology. Oh, just a bit there. Um, I need to get to yes. It is characterized by the use of technology, and this is evident in the way we live our lives even before COVID-19. What has happened more recently, um, and for me, I feel it's fortunate, is that we have been forced to recognize the value of technology and its capability in our everyday life. Um, hopefully, we will move away from our traditional methods of doing things, especially those that do not achieve efficiency or waste time and resources, um, which is what we would um, be able to establish. So for me, FOIR is not a time in the future, it is now. Um, and what it does in the built environment is what we need to establish ourselves. We need to view what challenges we have had and identify the existing solutions that technology offers us and opportunities to build um, solutions that are relevant in our environment. Keep trying to change screen. Um, so I'll give an example of what I think our country um, has suffered in terms of major challenges in the built environment, especially in provision of infrastructure. And for us, it's either time, we don't have enough time for certain things, we don't have enough money for certain things, and you're always concerned about quality. I want to challenge the built environment um, to consider the role we have in delivering solutions in this time of the of FOIR, if one would say. Um, do we still need to have our plans take up to six weeks for planning or building approval when there are so many collaboration tools that incorporate comments and approval levels and continued communication um, online or digitally? Do we still need to have buildings that take 12 to 18 months? And this is, if you are lucky, for them to be completed. When there's 3D printing, which can afford us guaranteed quality, reduced time, and fluidity of design, do we need to be physically anywhere to do our inspections when we can virtually transport ourselves in different locations in seconds, in seconds with augmented and virtual reality? Do we need to be calculating or analyzing numbers, assessing risk and scenarios when artificial intelligence and machine learning affords us the ability to duplicate our expertise and experience 
increasing our production levels by more than a thousand factor with much more accuracy and consistency than any human being is able to do. So can we do it? And um, for us, Advantage Properties, we have walked the journey and have been able to deliver a valuation platform, which we believe is an industry solution and solves certain issues that existed with regards to availability of information, um, professionals, cost of service, audit trail payments and things like that. This has been a well-received industry solution. And for us, we have no doubt, or I have no doubt that as a country, more and more solutions of this nature and even better can be produced. If we want to solve our problems, we can be able to solve them without any international consultant needing to help us. Um, I know that as I talk about FIRE and technology and all of that, and we're looking at this economic um, crisis, um, there's a thought that is tinkering in your mind um, about whether I'm advocating for us to lose our jobs. Um, in the times of this crisis, am I saying we should even attack the little jobs that we have and threaten our livelihood? And for me, that is not really what it is. I'm saying um, it is a new season that requires a new way of thinking. Um, this time, people are not factors of production. They are benefactors of production. I want to challenge you to consider why we do work. Um, I took the time to go into the history of um, the organization of work and the upcoming of work itself was simply um, what society structured the activities and labor that was necessary for survival. Work was basically created um, as essential in providing our basic physical needs of food, clothing and shelter. And now we have added more and more um, factors that we believe are, are essential to our living. In 4IR, if we use technology to do what we deem as work um, for production, <clears throat> that leads to the provision of those basic needs and more that we, that we believe we need. If all of that is taken care of, um, it allows us to lead the lives that are not anchored on work. We are at the beginning of a new time and, and the end of an era where economies are changing um, and disrupted. Uh, capitalism will be disturbed because what has become and will continue to become more important to us as a people is the value that we give to the next person. And that collaboration to achieve better for the greater good becomes more important. I'm a hopeless optimist. That's why I can go into technology and the built environment, all of the things that generally go wrong. But it's because I believe in humanity realizing that we, we can achieve more when we work together than when we compete. Something that I believe our forefathers knew very, very well. The way business used to operate is over. The cultures we have built will all fall away when the essentiality of business and your survival becomes apparent. There's no more time for time-wasting habits and activities. We need to be looking for real solutions. We need to be providing accommodation for our people, safe, healthy accommodation across the board and live lives that we deserve. So yes, as a way forward, I would say, yes, the economy will continue to change. Even the use of money as we know it, it will probably change, but we will survive. We will have a new economy, it will be digital. So in terms of how we deal with economic crisis, put on your, your gloves and your mask and get ready for um, a great ride as far as I'm concerned. So what does FOIA R or the evolution look like or the future of it look like? For me, I believe it talks about cleaner building methods because we're going to spend more time rather in our homes and in other safer environments than in our offices. Um, faster development timelines, um, more meaningful work, mindful building and sustainability, informed innovation and limited possibilities. Because with technology, you have information at your hands and, ha and when you have sufficient information in your hands, your possibilities are, are unlimited. For some, we may need to hang our hard hats. Are we ready to hang our hard hats? and work from our devices of choice from anywhere in the world. 
I cannot help but get excited because three years ago, when we discussed the average person working for four hours a week, it sounded like an unfathomable feat. But now we can very well see it after a lot of us have spent more than 40 days working from home. Once we establish collaboration tools, automation of manual calculation and repetitive work, there would be no need for you to be there as a human being, um, apart from providing perhaps guidance to the machine in areas that it may not have cognizance of decision making. If we get it right, it would mean increased productivity, giving back more time for human beings to fulfill other mindful activities. So we must not be afraid. We must embrace the change and prepare our lives um, to live better, more fulfilling um, lifestyles. So for me, I would say um, in 4IR digital economy or rather economic crisis, welcome to the new normal. Um, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Sepheba. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing that, that you, I mean, you are talking about technology, but you're also raising that very fundamental fear that um, a lot of us, I think, have. Most of us in our profession have been trained in, you know, the very manual aspects of, of the service that we deliver. I remember when AutoCAD came on board and people were saying, you know, it means that we will no longer need architects. And of course, in today, several years later, the technology has moved on to ARCHICAD, to Revit, to, to very many things, but the profession itself is still in need. So I find it, I mean, I would encourage people not to look at the advent of technology as the advent of technology as, as something, as you say, that's going to wipe, uh, wipe, wipe their existence away, you know. Um, our next speaker is going to be speaking to issues of leadership, you know, um, in, within the built environment. How do we lead ourselves uh, to a space and a place where um, there is actual real value in, in, in what we deliver as professionals? Real value, there's growth, there's in, innovation, there's, there's um, yeah, new ideas around how we deliver uh, what we do. Mayor Claire, can I hand over to you and uh, if you can talk us through this very exciting topic, these learnings from this difficult time that we've seen ourselves going through recently. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sister. I, I guess I also have to share my screen, but um, in the meantime, can I um, thank everyone who has actually organized this, uh, this event. It is very, very interesting to see how sometimes we converge in thinking. I, I'm not saying that I'm going to be speaking to what uh, Sateba talked to. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you, can you see my screen? Can somebody talk to me? Not yet. Okay, can, let me just end my show and start all over again. Is it anything visible there? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Um, my, my topic is actually very interesting because uh, it doesn't only talk to maybe a certain sector in the economy, it talks to everyone. We are all really moving away from a very tough and challenging uh, time or phase in our lives as leaders. I assume that we are leaders and we have to now start looking into how can we move forward? How, how are we going to get our organizations to move forward? So, the, the first thing that really we need to understand is historically challenge for leaders is to manage the crisis while you are actually also building a future for other people. So it's, it's not only for you as a person, as an organization, 
as how do I make sure that my organization exists, but I also make sure that the people that I work with, the people that I collaborate with, my employees are actually getting value for the services that I give. And what does the future really look like for me? So as we move from responding to COVID-19, leaders in organizations, leaders outside organizations, presidents, ministers, they have to shift from thinking about today to tomorrow. What is going to happen tomorrow? And we, re we responded. We, the COVID-19 came, we responded, we stayed at home, we worked, if you did. Some didn't manage to work because we were not prepared to work from home. That was a phase. Now we have to prepare ourselves to go back to our new normal. I call it a new normal because I don't see us going back to what we used to actually be doing. We have to go face those uncertainties. Yes, we are opening the economy, we are going outside our homes. Who knows, we might be back next week. I'm not jinxing anything, but we might be back next week. We have to go face our uncertainties. You know, as leaders, we now need to be looking back and asking ourselves, how is our followership? Did we really do enough to develop leaders within our organizations who can help us to move on? We need to actually nurture and build greater trust because people have to now know whether we are going to be able to move you know, on with them or are we going to leave them behind? We need to anticipate what success looks like post COVID. Nobody knows what is going to happen tomorrow or next week or next month, but we have to go back and anticipate what is going to happen. We need to define organizational goals to achieve that. How, how does the picture look like post COVID? How do we expect to move on? We need to guide our people and facilitate them to sprint there because unfortunately we are already existing. We can't afford not to sprint. And we have to build resilient organizations. The question now is what, what is, what is resilient? You know, it is not, it's definitely not the one that cannot simply go back to where we, we were before COVID-19. If you are thinking, I'll quickly go in and find out how I can go back to where I was that is not resilience. Resilience is what would have transformed and we have to build the desired attitudes, the beliefs, the agility and structures into our DNA. We have to go back and say to ourselves, we have to recover, but where, where we were is not where we can be. We have to move beyond that place and move forward. And the thing about this situation is we have to shift our thinking to a very unpredictable and, you know, at, you know that place where you have no idea how it is actually going to respond to anything that you think. So we are moving our activities from those unpredictable frenetic activities to response where it was about, we have to go back. We have to go home, we have to work from home. We have to provide internet. We have to make sure that people can work and access our, our networks from outside. We have to ensure that our stakeholders can actually be able to contact us even when we are in lockdown. Now, we are going into our new normal where leaders need to envision the, the, you know, the picture of recovery. We have to now ask ourselves, how are we going to recover? Focus is now uh, from ensuring employee safety and business operational continuity to the outside. We have to continue serving our stakeholders. What are our stakeholders expecting from us? How are we going to serve them rather than uh, our internal processes? We're no longer going to just manage the crisis or keeping the organization running. We have to manage the transition as well. So you can imagine how taxing that is going to be. It is now time for project recovery. And with dedicated, skilled resources, some of them may not be the same resources that you used for response, 
because all of us have our own leadership abilities. There are people who can respond and act on a crisis and do everything quickly, but they are not able to be able to take you forward. You have to live with that. Planning is not about contingency anymore. You're, you require people who can assist your organization to craft long-term economic and scenario plans. And as I was saying earlier on to somebody, scenario planning is about guessing. You are taking consideration of impact on operations, on staff, on budget, on what you think your stakeholders are going to actually require from you. And you have to align everything to that. And yet you are not even sure your guess is right. Leadership attitude has to change from reactive to that of anticipation. Anticipation to rebuild, you need to look at how you're going to influence and energize and inspire your people to embrace the vision we have for the future. Remember this vision is something that you are also anticipating and trying to draw in your own head, but at the same time, you have to make other people come on board and you know, run to that uh, destination with you. You need to remember, very, very importantly, you need to remember trust has to be actually built because if, you don't, if your people don't trust you, if your stakeholders don't trust you, chances of you influencing them to think differently about you is go going to be very, very difficult. And the shift that we envisaged uh, just before COVID-19 uh, hit us, you know, we knew construction could take years, 28 months, fifth, you know, five years, six years. You wouldn't build a 20-story building in two days, in five days, in 10 days. But, you know, it was amazing how China showed us that you can, actually, because when they had to respond to COVID-19, they built two hospitals in less than two weeks. I think everybody was like, we are waiting to see how that is going to actually uh, pan out. Pan out it did. Yes, I hear there were some problems afterwards, but if it was for response to COVID-19, it actually served its purpose. There, it is important to judge your timing, moving from response to, uh, to recovery, because it is, it is not everybody who is going to recover at the same time. All of us went into our uh, lockdowns at different stages in our, in, our, in our organizations where technology probably wasn't very good in some organizations. Some organizations were right there. They had already started working from home long before COVID-19. So um, your moving to the recovery has to also be timed well. As, as a leader, there is this uh, law, yeah, John Maxwell, that says that the law of timing. It is very, very important for a leader no, to know when to do certain things, else you may miss an opportunity. And uh, this depends on the impact of COVID to your to business, as I, I've said, what your business model looked like before you went COVID-19. If, if your business model was such that you had multiple multinational collaborations, you had people that you were working with outside uh, Botswana and they have been hard hit or less hit, you know, you have to now start asking yourselves, how can we, you know, start that particular collaboration again and keep our organizations moving forward without really now texting the other one who probably is not ready to assist you. Media and technology companies have suffered less impact, so they may, have to, they may be able to recover quicker. And there's no one size fits all for anybody. And in my last slide, I am trying to actually uh, say to people, like um, everything about COVID-19, the threat, the old roadmaps are not actually going to work. You know, you need reliable, unique, and rethinking of what is going to have to happen. Recover, can you, you have to think about, you want to recover and grow revenues? If you in the built environment, biggest stakeholder is government, can you anticipate what government is thinking about right now to recover the economy? 
Is it going to be infrastructure development or maintenance and going into IT projects? Agility is key in decision making right now. So you have to actually know that your customers have changed in terms of how they think going forward. They want different service from what they had pre-COVID-19. I, I guess I've given you, you know, an insight into the kind of thinking our leaders have to have you know, in, in managing COVID-19 post uh, activities. And um, I'll be open for uh, questions moving forward. Thank you very much, uh, Sita, for, for the time. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Claire, for that. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things that uh, we have, you and I have spoken about that has really stuck in my mind is this issue of, of sustainability of our practices, you know, um, within the built environment and even businesses in general. It, one of the most distressing things for me during this time was the discovery that there are so many businesses that do not survive beyond a month, you know, with a month without being, you know, at work or, or billing or means that your, your business grinds to a halt and you're, you're unable to, to support uh, your staff and to support the overall business obligations that uh, business and financial obligations that that you have. So, it is about leadership. It is about you know our our leaders within the profession, our leaders uh, within politics, and our leaders in the society at large, taking that step and saying what needs to be done to create sustainable practices over and above. Uh, what we have at the moment. What, what is our long-term strategic thinking around sustainability of, of, of practice? So our next speaker is um, Gahiso Sebetso, who is talking about something that in my view um, has been neglected. It has been neglected in, in, in the past in the built environment, given very little attention. And I think that the period of time that we have had leading up to, you know, leading up to the, the time around COVID, you know, going through this lockdown phase and coming out of it, one of the key things is what is our thinking around issues of sustainability and issues of, of green building. It's a neglected aspect that I think if we don't take cognizance of what, um, what a positive impact this can have, not only in terms of the sustainability of practice, but the sustainability of the environment that, that, that we have, um, then we as a people are really doing ourselves a, a disservice. So, Gary, so I'm going to hand over to you to talk us through this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, can great. Um, I know that there's a problem with my video, um, so if you can't see it, it's okay, we'll just carry on. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak about the impact of COVID-19 on the landscape of the built environment. And I know that a lot of people, you know, actually all of us are feeling the negative impacts, and some of us are coming to terms with some of the positive changes that we have to make. And I think one of the positive changes that we have to make as an industry um, is that COVID-19 is really pulling us to uh, from being just the built environment to being the green built environment. And that is something that I'm passionate about, it's something that really excites me. Um, so I hope that, I'll, that some of that passion will be contagious this afternoon. So, you know, a lot of people, when they hear the words green building, they kind of get lost. It's like, what on earth are you talking about? What is a green building? Our buildings are great as they are. And um, some people kind of reference, you know, first world countries who are doing well in that aspect. And they think, well, that is such an unattainable aspect. And if I can just give it to you in a nutshell and say that a green building is basically an efficient building. And um, 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to have a building that is efficient? We know about efficient cars, efficient systems and machines, but what is an efficient building? It's basically a building that works well, and this is how we can tell. So your building is efficient if it uses relatively low energy and has relatively low water consumption. And in that we're talking about, typically we see that in our electricity bills and in our water bills. And the energy is consumed through our lighting and also through the heating and cooling systems that we use. And those also use water in, in commercial spaces and so on. And just the way that we use water in our building. Another way that we can tell that a building is efficient is the fact that it's self-sustainable and that it relies on renewable energy sources. Okay, so what, what that means is that say we have a power cut. Okay, what does that mean if, you know, for your building? Is it going to carry on working when we run out of coal? Um, when, you know, there's load shedding, is your building going to carry on? If it is a self-sustainable building, and it's efficient and it uses reliable, renewable energy sources, of course it will carry on working. The third way to tell is that a building has a really good relationship with the environment. So what that means is that it's not harmful for the environment and buildings can be harmful for the environment through things like pollution and the waste that we produce during construction phase. So I like what Sateva spoke about um, in terms of the way that we do construction um, is going to change. So that would be very exciting to see. And another way, last way for this um, presentation is the quality of the indoor environment. So it's not too hot, not too cold. The lighting is good and not all lighting is artificial. You can enjoy some natural lighting without glare and so on. You can look out the window and see some greenery. Okay, so now then the question is, well, how does COVID-19 take us from being just the built environment to being the green built environment? Well, let's look at some of the things we've had to do to adapt and how that will influence the way that buildings will look and how they'll be designed. This is something that also excites me. So for example, we've had to live with social distancing, we've had to have digitalization of businesses and services, and we've had to work remotely, right? So during this time, our buildings have been sitting empty, our big buildings that have, um, you know, we've used so much concrete on them, so much, so many building materials, we've got all these basement parking in large volumes. Our boardrooms are sitting empty. And um, so that is bound to change, okay? So the design of our buildings is gonna change in size, and we're going to focus more on functionality. And gone are the days of filing and storage, big storage spaces. I've been surprised at how much, I've, how little I've needed to print over the last little while. And then you wonder, why have we been using so much paper in our offices when we can pack things up digitally? And educational facilities will change because of all the social distancing and so on. Residential building designs are going to change. We now need some office or working space in our own houses. Um, parents need some learning space for their children um, if children have to do school at home. So that's also an exciting aspect. But overall, what it does is that buildings are going to change in size and it's, they're going to become more functional than just this over-design monster that we kind of put out there. Um, so we will still need buildings for some sort of productivity to carry on in society. So we can agree on that. Um, now, how will this translate into a green built environment? Okay, so if we look at some of the changes that are happening in terms of design, um, we are going to use a lot less uh, harmful building materials than we did before, um, such as concrete and all the other harmful ones. And I think for designers, it's going to be easier to work with aspects of natural lighting and natural ventilation when they're working with uh, more optimal, sizable buildings. 
um, as opposed to when they're working with super large buildings. Those buildings will consume less energy um, because we're not trying to, you know, provide a heating and cooling system for 10,000 square meters worth of a building. We are actually now doing it for smaller spaces. And renewable energy infrastructure can now become cheaper. Trying to put up a solar power plant for 10,000 10, square meter building um, is very different and more expensive than trying to do the same for, say, a 500 square meter building. So, I hope you are now excited about how this is now pushing us in that direction. It's stuff we need to be talking about. And now for our industry, the question is how do we adapt? Um, this is a big call for designers and builders. Um, I think we are very privileged to still have designers who are from a generation that has experienced indigenous design, indigenous knowledge, people who have visited grandparents in the villages and so on, who um, have seen indigenous materials being used for buildings. And I would like to actually say that we need to start looking within our context. We need to start looking in our culture because so often when we think of green building, we want to adapt technologies from first world countries and it just doesn't fit here. It doesn't fit into our budget. We can learn from it, but um, sometimes it's not sustainable for us and it's really unattainable. And so the question is, what do we use in terms of the indigenous, indigenous knowledge, technology materials that we have? And that is something that designers and builders need to take up and combine that with international exposure that they've had. And another way is, our alternative local energy sources. Um, I laughed, you know, by myself when I wrote that um, organic waste part. And I think we could put our cattle to good use. You know, there's so much organic waste from that that we could use for biofuel, um, especially in residential spaces. Um, I know of people who started using biodiesels up, um, sorry, down south in the country. And our biggest resource in Botswana that we often complain about in the summer, that being the sun. And there's a whole lot of talk about we need to start using solar power. Uh, and I think we need to start educating ourselves about it. And we need to start approaching the government more and more about it, particularly as the built environment and saying, hey, we need to use this. And lastly, our people. Um, I think that um, one of the things I appreciate about Botswana is that, you know, when it comes to this green building thing, it's not that people are not willing, it's just that people don't know. And we need to educate our society and we need to raise an awareness in our society. And I really believe that it's something that will excite our people. And so when that happens, it means that the market is informed about an alternative way. And I really believe that they will be for it. I can't see them being against it uh, to a large degree. And this is the market that creates demand um, for the designers and they will want that and designers will start to collaborate with them in creating something um, that is good for our environment. And, and you're wondering, but why should we go down this route? Um, I put financial benefits at the forefront um, because it's, it's an incentive for most people um, in the sense that, you know, operational costs will be lower. And um, once we start getting into it and once it becomes the norm, even the capital costs will go down. And um, secondly, energy efficiency. We want to be able to use our power well. We want um, to, to be able to have to not have issues of we're going to run out of coal or you know we have load shedding and so on that we want to be able to store our energy efficiently and know that we get it from the environment and that it's never going to run out um, and in terms of water we know that water is an issue in Botswana and um, I met a young Botswana man who started who was trying to introduce a technology called hydro panels um, where he's harvests water from the air using solar panels. And I thought, wow, this is brilliant. You know, instead of just looking to the rain for water, are we sustainable when the rainy seasons are gone for a long while? Um, and 
you know, those are things we need to start thinking about. What can we do so that we are self-sustainable as a nation? And lastly, because we actually do care about our environment, it is our heritage. And um, this is the legacy that we're also going to leave for the generations to come. And we actually do love our country. It's a young, we have a young industry that still has a chance to get things right um, it, as far as the environment is concerned and green buildings are concerned. So we really have a great opportunity to set an example uh, for other areas in the, in the region. So yeah, thank you so much. I hope that you can start thinking along those lines of, are my lights on all day? You know, or what can I do to get some natural lighting and so on? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kahisa, for that. Um, I mean, essentially, a lot of what we're talking about today, unfortunately, is um, is a taster. Um, behind every one of our pre presenters for today's session is a wealth of knowledge, uh, a wealth of tried and tested experience and experience specific to Botswana. You know, for me, one of the most positive outcomes of, of us being uh, forced into these digital communication platforms is, is that on the one hand, we've been able to be incredibly inclusive. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're in Francis Town, you know, you, you can still attend the seminar, you can still, you know, participate in these gatherings. You don't have to be physically in any one place. Um, this technology has given us an opportunity to engage um, across the, the, the broader aspects of our profession. And for me, this platform has also given us an opportunity to give a to to listen and learn from you know members of our profession who as i said earlier sit on this extreme body of, of wealth of knowledge that uh, we all stand to to benefit from so ladies thank you very much for your your input today everything that um we've done in this uh in this session and the last one really would not have been possible without the initiative from uh, both Minical Academy and also the Botswana Women in Construction. Whilst you as uh, participants uh, have a moment to think and direct some questions to our speakers, I'd like to give an opportunity to both Minical Academy and Botswana Women in Construction um, to talk briefly about who they are and what they offer. Um, as it's the hard work of uh, women like this that have brought us to where we are today. So I'll start with, um, with Minical Academy and you as participants, can you please, um, you know, uh, start lining up the questions to, to, to our speakers today. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Chanda from Minical Academy. Um, a training institute um, that exists um, to train uh, on built environment programs. Basically, we train and we upskill uh, built environment practitioners. Um, this is a great platform and we thank all participants uh, for coming on um, and for supporting this second webinar and the first one. I get the feeling Chanda is shouting at her child at this moment. <laughs> I really apologize. And these are some of the, these are some of the perks of, of working from home and some of the things that we're going to be seeing happening. And I hope as we continue to unpack um, and discuss, we'll be discussing some of these things because we are likely to see ourselves working from home more often um, during this year, during the COVID period. Um, basically, I, I think to just sum up CETA for the little, uh, during the little minute that you've given us, our website is available www.minaclacademy.ac.bw. We've got a Facebook page also, uh, Minacle Academy, and um, we'll be uh, I think advertising a lot of our programs uh, through that uh, platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chanda. Could I ask uh, Buinello to just briefly introduce uh, women, Botswana women in construction and talk about their role in getting us to where we are today. Thank you. Hello everyone um, and thank you for joining in. I hope I'm audible. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, 
I'm Buinela Masuku, and I'm just representing um, a fairly new um, organization called Botswana Women in Construction Organization, BOWICO. Um, what we, we seek to do, um, oh, can you see my screen? Let me just make it bigger for everyone to see. Um, okay, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, so what, what our, our big idea is, is to empower women in the construction industry um, to really just be successful. Um, and when we say the construction industry, and the, we, we really mean the whole um, value chain of construction. So if you can think of the pre-feasibility um, section, the feasibility, the planning, implementation, construction, and the whole building life cycle, managing buildings, the facilities, and so on. Um, so this is, this is where our interest lies, the whole value chain, and would just love more and more women to, to join us in our organization. Um, um, and our objectives are really creating awareness, um, networking, mentorship, and forming strategic partnerships. I, as you can see, we're probably um, on our first objective there of creating awareness um, through these webinars. Um, and uh, we really are trying to work through some of them um, to, to just empower women, as, as I'd said before. Let me just share our last slide, my last slide with you. And that picture really is just about what we are. We rise by lifting each other up. Um, you can contact us for those who would like to join the organization. You can contact us on Bowico, bw at gmail.com. Our, our number is 7453-1224. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we hope to have you on on our next webinars we shall carry on um interacting with you thank you Sita. thank you very much uh Buinello. um we have a question here and this question is directed to gary so what do you think will necessitate the shift towards green practices within um our local industry so uh, what what is actually needed what is the big push is it is it mindset is it money um, you know, if you can briefly summarize this question to say, you know, if you are going to, what are the big one, two, threes that are going to have to change in our local environment uh, to move us to, to green practices in the built environment? Okay, um, very good question. Um, and I think the I think the number one thing is education and awareness. And I don't mean it in the academic sense or anything like that. I believe that if, um, if the industry players, as industry players, we can educate Botswana about um, these building technologies or uh, green building technologies that are available to us and accessible to us, then this will create a demand and make people recognize the need for it. I think that at the moment, uh, for as long as people don't know um, how expensive it is to actually have um, a conventional building running in terms of water and electricity, you know, if they don't know that, then they're not going to ask for something better. They're not going to ask for something different. Um, so I think the first thing would be that uh, knowledge and and education, just the general knowledge and education to our society to stir up that demand and to make people recognize the need for it. And I think secondly, um, you know, at some point, the government will have to get in on it, um, especially from a commercial point of view, where, um, you know, the commercial part of our industry is very much driven by profits and viabilities and feasibilities and so on. If people can't see how this is going to, you know, give them money, then they think, well, we'll just make money the way that we've been making it at all costs. Um, and I think, you know, certain policies and legislation that is directed at protecting our resources and our environment will, uh, in a way, push people or push the industry in that direction. Um, so those are, you know, those are the two things that I could think of off the top of my head, except the last one being examples. I think as we educate and 
as we share the knowledge about the benefits of these things, one of the key things would be able to would be to be able to have demonstrations of saying this is what other people are doing and this is how it benefits them because people want to see tangible results. So it would be good to be able to demonstrate that and to showcase that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. We've got a we've got a hand up from Rao Khagala Subata. Um, our host will unmute you so you can comment or, or ask a question. Let's hear from you, Rao Khagala. How Kakala, you are unmuted. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Um, morning, ladies. Sorry, afternoon, ladies. Uh, my question is related to the green technology in our construction industry. Uh, I'm sitting here as an event planner with interest in green buildings and wondering, are we ready to embrace the technology? For example, while we are still waiting for the amendments of our codes to ensure that our buildings are green, are we ready to accept the rejection maybe from those local authorities who would be initiative enough to say, can you consider the basics of uh, the green technology? If I'm to say your application does not meet at least the basics for it being green, are you ready to accept, maybe as an architect, Mehmet, are you ready to accept that? Or you would say, since it is not in the code, why are you enforcing it? Thank you. Okay, I, I can maybe uh, you know uh, respond to part of to part of that question, and and Gariso will probably respond to the other part. Um, so in two thousand and three. Uh, a guideline was developed for what we call passive uh design guidelines for for you know in, in i'm trying to remember the correct title off the top of my head but passive design um you know sustainable passive design guidelines so in other words a set of guidelines around how you design buildings uh, how you design spaces around buildings and how you design the larger urban fabric using uh passive energy uh, guidelines. Um, this book showed how with the existing laws, the existing materials that are approved currently, um, you would design sustainable building spaces and the same thinking would then apply to how you develop your urban spaces and you plan your, and you plan your cities and towns and, and, and villages. So there's already an existing guideline that shows you how to do it. It's not a law, but it's a guideline that shows how you can do it within the context of what we have. There is no doubt that our environment needs to open up for new uh, building materials, uh, for old building materials in a new context. And I'm thinking of rammed earth in this particular context. So there's, you know, our legislation absolutely has to be changed to allow for experimentation and use of new materials. So for me, this is, is, is one of the items that is on our hot list in terms of things that we have to do as a profession. We have to revise our code. Um, we, we have to re revise our planning code, our building regulations code uh, to catch up with the opportunities that we find uh, right now. And this is where I think as a private sector, we absolutely have to be um, at the forefront. But I don't think we need to wait for those laws. We have, even within the existing building code, we have an opportunity for buildings to be built on the basis of being research buildings. So building buildings with experimental materials and technologies in order to demonstrate that they actually can function are habitable and they are fit for purpose and they are, they are safe. So that would be my response. Um, uh, actually, there's nothing holding us back but our, our own limitations in our own minds. And also being held back, like you say, by planning authorities and building approval authorities that um, are not aware uh, enough, that haven't got the knowledge that we're trying to share at the moment and um, are gatekeepers as opposed to enablers of progression and innovation. Thank you. 
Cariso, I'll let you answer the second part. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, very, I agree with you, uh, uh, Sita, on that. And I, I think we are more ready than we actually think uh, or we can imagine. Um, and I think I just want to say that, you know, materials are only one part that actually would, you know, render a building a green building, if that makes sense. Um, so, so there's the, there is the component of having um, new building materials that we would have to introduce and experiment and see how they work and get that approved. But I would say that would be one out of 10 um, of the issues that we need to deal with in order to make a building green. So I'm going to give very practical, simple examples of you know, some of the things that we overlook um, that would show that actually it is at the tip of our hands. For example, um, particularly with government offices that are really large and you know you find a floor that's like 200 square meters big and you walk in and the lights are on um, because you need lighting, the whole artificial lighting all day long. And even that, when that whole space is not occupied and there are only five people in that entire space, and yet the lights are, are, are on right across the entire room and the lights are not zoned and, you know, they don't have motion sensors to say, okay, um, the lights will only go on in a certain part of the room for as long as there's movement in that room. So for as long as the rest of the space is not occupied, the lights will automatically be off. That is something that is already there and it's not an expensive um, technology to implement or even a hard one to access. Um, things like designing for more daylight to come into a building rather than relying on lighting the whole day. Um, so a lot of this stuff is actually dependent on the way that we design uh, our buildings more than just the materials that we use for our buildings. So I think that we are ready. Um, so if you look at things like thermal comfort, uh, is a building too hot or too cold? I think the architects would be able to comment on that, that you need more than just building materials to actually attain you know, the right thermal comfort for a building to function. Um, another thing is we need to talk more about existing materials because there are materials that are less harmful than others. There are certain paints that um, have less gas emissions than others and it's just a matter of putting it out there and saying you know with what we have and with what is approved this is the best probably the best practice um, that we can use in the market um, so i hope i'm answering the question when i say that we are actually we, we are far more ready than we think we are although there is some work to be done um, in terms of building codes and so on but it's not the type that would hold us back. It's not something that we need to wait for before we plunge in. Right, thank you for that, Kathy. So we have a, a question here directed to, um, you know, I'm gonna let Claire speak and then we'll go back to, um, we'll go back to a question that's uh, directed at at Kariso possibly, but uh, Claire, can you elaborate more on the law of time? and what it is that the current leaders can learn from it to drive the industry post COVID-19. Um, I'm not sure if Matsiriso Sesuai is talking about leaders within the built environment or you know, leaders as in our political leaders, um, but um, I'll pass that question on to you, Claire, and then we can go back to, to Tabucho. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sita. As, as I mentioned when I started speaking, leadership actually is, is universal. It, it doesn't matter which sector you are in, you have to have leadership uh, skills and you have to actually apply them according to how you, know, you, you have to respond to certain things. The, the issue of timing, I guess, from, from post COVID-19 is saying to you, I think Setebe also touched on it, the issue of how long can you make a decision? Is it, is it possible for you to shorten the time to three? Claire, I think you've accidentally muted your mic. So you're back. Okay. okay. 
So, yeah, as I was saying, the, the importance of timing is such that everything that we do, so Tebe mentioned it as well earlier on, is it really necessary for it to take three days or six months or 12 months for decision to be made? COVID-19 has shown us that it is possible to make decisions within a day, even in our Ministry of Infrastructure and Housing Development, where you would actually, in ministries, you would wait for a month to be given feedback on certain things. They, we, we have seen that it can actually happen. So for me, when it comes to issue of timing, there are a lot of things that we have to be thinking about. We, we have to be making decisions very, very quickly. We have to be decisive. We are dealing with unknown unknowns, you know, as they, all, as they say it, you have to always be agile in terms of how quickly can I make a decision. There is issue of social contracts that we, we made with our employees, we made with our, our collaborating uh, partners. We have to make sure that we, we give information when it is needed quickly as how it is actually needed. If you are looking for a response as an employee on whether I will be catered for in terms of my salary. You cannot be waiting for a, a, a week for somebody to actually be talking to their board members and seeing how those things can happen. If you are looking for a decision to be made on a contract of whether next week you will be doing construction in Mahalape or in Kasani, you cannot be waiting for a whole month because MTC has not set. So these are the kind of things that we are talking about. As leaders, we have to go back and review our, our models, our business models, our decision-making models. And I think I like a comment that was made by Refilo earlier on. She talked about issue of everybody having to be a team player. And this now goes back to how well did you develop your people to be team players? How, how well as leaders did you make your people know that their, their voice is important? They can actually contribute meaningfully. They, you allow them to be, to be wrong if they have to be wrong. Because at this time, we are, we are innovating. We are coming up with new ways of doing things. And there are chances that people can actually go wrong. They may not be you know, going into it thinking, I'm going to propose something that is wrong to my boss. They are doing it because they're trying to be innovative. So you have to create that environment where people are allowed to, to actually uh, go wrong. Can we wait a week, a month, a year to go digital? I don't think it's an answer, that, a question that I can answer, but I can say to you that the more time you take, the less you're going to be able to be sustainable as, as an organization. So for me, that is what time is really into. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Claire. So there's, there's two questions, one on the chat, um, and I think, uh, both questions. Well, there's two questions directed uh, at Minical Academy, and I would ask those two uh, to get in touch with Minical Academy directly after this session and, um, and, and follow up. Uh, is Minical Academy open to individuals uh, or only to organizations? Um, I'll ask Chanda to just re respond to that uh, on the chat. But there was a question here that from Tabuho Mudisa happy to say the Botswana Green Building Council was launched in 2016. You know, we haven't really felt any impact from, you know, the Botswana Green Building Council since it, it's launched. Uh, and Rory San goes on to ask, what are the main challenges in green building construction? So to me, these two questions speak to the same issue. One is we are missing some kind of association institutional support for green building. Do we have that? Is it active? What form is it, you know, is copying or copying a structure from another country into our country? Has that worked for us Is you know, what is, yeah, what did we, what aspirations did we have around the Green Building Council and what is required to take it forward? And what are, what are other challenges in general in terms of trying to get green building values into our construction industry? So, Kariso, I'll hand that to you. Thanks. Um, I'm really glad that um, Deborah has, you know, given some input into that. She is the chairperson of the Botswana Green Building Council. And um, 
I've, rec I've just recently joined them and I think she also started recently. And um, we, we are working hard to get it going. And I think one of the biggest um, needs for the Green Building Council is, is um, endorsement and support in a very practical way uh, from the government side, um, of, you know, in terms of funding, in terms of policies that we would like to have or see in place. And another thing is wanting to have something like, you know, in, in the commercial space, people want to have some sort of green rating system and uh, for us to be able to establish our own, you know, that will take time. And then the question is, okay, then which, which green rating system do you adapt? So basically the purpose of that green rating system would be to, to assess a building and say, well, this building meets the, the criteria or the standards that are required to qualify a building as green um, and so on. So the I think with the new president, the new chairperson of the Botswana Green Building Council and just seeing how much work the Boha has done um, in order to work with other green building councils around Africa, learning from them and seeing what their approach has been in breaking ground, particularly with um, proper recognition from government and proper mobilization, um, you know, to be able to, to fulfill its mandate, uh, one of which is to, you know, educate, make people aware, but also to come up with a, its own green rating system where we can evaluate and assess buildings. Um, you know, government has to, legislation has to come alongside that. Um, you know, as we've spoken about existing building co codes versus new building codes and so on. Um, so that's the first part, Sita, can you remind me of the second part of the question, please? The second part, the second part was just about how what, challenges in, in general. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I can, if I can lead with some aspects, you know, in, in my experience as an architect, um, I hope none of my clients are listening because often um, I don't even tell them that they're getting cavity walls, which will perform better than a standard 230 wall as an exterior element, for example. Um, because I believe that certain things should just be a given at the stage where we are as a society or, you know, if you're building a five million Pula house, you really should be able to afford to build, um, you know, a, a cavity wall to improve the thermal perform performance of your space. So I think just one or two quick short examples around uh, the challenges that you face in general in terms of uh, trying to get people to understand the benefits of green approaches to, to building and construction. Okay. Um, so I would, so I'd break that up into say in the commercial space and versus residential space. Um, I think the, one of the big challenges in the, in the commercial in, um, industry or property market is that, you know, people build with, one goal in mind and their goal is I need to get a structure up it needs to be able to meet my needs and be functional and I need to be able to get money from it and spend on it as little as possible um, and people often only think of the capital cost so the cost of actually getting that building up um, but don't really put a lot of work into the life cycle costs of that building and usually that's where you see the benefits of green building construction is in the the building's life cycle and it's in its operational costs um, so some of the practices um, that would enable that building to operate as green going forward would probably be a little bit more expensive than the conventional way of, of doing things um, so that's one of the bigger challenges is that people are looking at the immediate cost instead of looking at the long-term benefits. Um, so that would be more in the commercial space. And then they're actually the other thing is they're looking at what is the incentive then, what is the immediate incentive um, 
for developers. They want to build and then they're going to sell. And if having this building is green is not going to have make a difference to the value to the market value of the property if it's not going to make a difference to the selling price of the property then why should i even bother um so that's the other challenge that we have i think um in terms of the residential space um that i, I feel like that's where a lot of there's a lot of lack of information um and, and the difference between the two is that when you're dealing with a commercial building, you have a project team that sits around the table and they go through design solutions and they talk them through. But when you're dealing with a residential um, building, a lot of people have an informal way of procuring um, residential buildings. It's usually people who have money to build something like a 5 million Pula house who will sit with an architect and go through um, the design and go through a whole lot of technologies in that regard. But generally, a larger part of our residential market is informal. And it's just somebody saying, hey, I need to find a draftsman to design this for me. It's a house. It needs the function of a house. And so then I'm going to find a builder to, to put it up for me. Um, so formal professional input is very limited in that space. And then that's where um, you know, information isn't brought to the table for people to make decisions based on, on good information. So thanks for that, uh, Kelly. So um, we, we have one last question um, and Rifilo is going to be very upset with me, but um, I've got a good reason for not answering her question now um, because her question is, um, an excellent introduction to what we are going to be covering um, in our one of the aspects that we're going to be covering in much more detail in our next uh, webinar. So, you know, we've, we've talked in very broad terms um, about the opportunities that are there in terms of transforming into tech solutions, the apps that exist, the software that is out there. We've talked in general terms about, um, you know, the, the strength of leadership that one needs to have in order to embrace uh, some of these new things, these new ways of doing anything. I am as much a culprit as anybody else is. You know, I'm always eternally grateful for, the, for my younger members of staff because they are constantly challenging me to say, you know, you know, we can do this, you know, we can do that, you know, you can use this software. So, and, you know, for me, these three aspects that we've spoken about today are, are intertwined. You know, embracing technology requires uh, brave leadership, not necessarily just from the older, but also from the younger generation, just saying, oldies, you need to step aside. Um, and, it, and it also requires embracing new values around the spaces that we, we build. Um, you know, green technology, sustainability, and those kind of issues. So, Rifile, to get a detailed answer to your question around what are the platforms that are available and what has been the impact of those platforms currently and going forward um, is a beautiful uh, introduction or a, what can I call it, an, an advert to what our next uh, webinar will be, one of our next webinars will be, will be talking about. So I would just like to thank everybody for taking the time to, to come to today's session. Um, I hope you found it uh, interesting. It is meant as an, as an introduction to larger topics that we face in the built environment. And the women who you have met today, you know, please seek them out. They are experts in their area and um, are available to consult uh, on a wealth of issues related to what we've been talking about today. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much, ladies, and thank you very much to our listeners. And I hope you've enjoyed today's session. Thank you very much, Sita.